Well, good morning, everybody. I will invite you uh, to join us if you're out in the foyer still. Come on in, and uh, we're going to get started here shortly. It's a beautiful winter morning and uh, our winter fest weekend. I don't know how many people were active at that in some way this weekend, or maybe getting out yourself, or maybe at the the, the great fishing derby I heard about, good time out there on the lake, uh, trying to get onto the lake and all of that, very adventurous. Um, uh, a good winter weekend uh, to enjoy each other and enjoy being outside. I'm going to start and invite you into worship uh, with a proverb that long ago King Solomon uh, gathered, and it went like this, uh, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. But when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. And our modern world tries to make us forget at times that, um, forget that we're connected, that all parts of ourselves are connected, our bodies, our hearts, our spirits, our souls. They're all knit together and we can't be pulled apart. That's how God made us. And so some of us are arriving here with smiles on our faces, joyful hearts. Um, others of us are arriving here with one part feeling broken and sad, uh, maybe because of the world that we're in and the suffering we're seeing in Ukraine, maybe uh, because it feels for you like winter is never going to end, and so that's getting you down, uh, maybe because of something in your family or something in your own body um, that's, that's hard right now. Um, but first, let me say to you, welcome, and uh, we're glad you're here whether you're physically here with us, whether you're joining us online, um, whether you're wearing a mask, whether you're not wearing a mask, we're glad you're here. Um, because not only are we knit together as individuals, we're knit together with one another. Um, we're knit together in what Paul calls the body of Christ. And it's here, we're welcomed by Jesus. And so we come to him with broken spirits or cheerful hearts, whatever we're going through. Uh, we come here and we worship the risen Lord Jesus. Um, so just join me in an opening prayer. Father, we know you are here. You've created all things. You've created us. And you invite us um, through your son. And through your son is your great gesture of welcome. And through your spirit, you knit us together and you fill us. So be with us this morning as we worship. Amen. Thanks, Rod. I want you to stand with us as we uh, worship in song together. Uh, our first two songs you want to sing are uh, songs that allow us to be reminded of who it is that we're worshiping and the, uh, the opportunity to stand in love, the opportunity that God is faithful. Um, so I want you just to sing, sing loud with us this morning. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. My fear doesn't 
can't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. There's power in your name. Sing that again. There is power. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. Power in your name, power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shape winds and walls Preach to my doubt, you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. I'm standing on your word, I'm calling heaven down. To earth. You will fight my enemies, this will end in victory, and I will believe it, yes, I will believe it. You make mountains move, you make giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my feet. Preach to my doubt, you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now, you were faithful then, you'll be faithful now. And I know that I know you never fail, yes I know that I know you never wait.
Cause I know you'll make a way I don't always understand I don't always get to see But I will believe it Cause I will believe it Worthy is the Blessed 
Jesus, Lord of all. Um, it's a good place. Good, good thing to think about. Good thing to remember in our world today. Uh, take a couple minutes now to uh, just transition from worship in song to worship in family news. It's part of worship, too. Um, just to talk a little bit about what's happening, what's going on here, and uh, that'll transition us into the rest of our service. Um, we sent this out in our weekly email this week, but of course, as you know, there are some changes in Saskatchewan around our guidelines yet again. Um, and so, again, we just want to send the message loud and clear, mask, no mask, you're welcome here. It's just good to have you. Um, we want to just be a place of welcome, because we're welcomed by Jesus. Um, one of the implications of that is still we're going to keep our balcony with some uh, slightly distant seating up there. So um, what that means is we need to use these bottom seats maybe a little better than we do sometimes. So just a nudge that, you know, next week when you come in, challenge yourself. Can I sit one pew forward where I usually sit um, so that so we can keep the back um, open for those who might end up arriving a little bit later and for some of those who need to slip out to the foyer occasionally um, let's let's use the use our all our seating down here a um, couple other implications one is we're gonna be our M bistro our coffee after the service will be available today in the in the foyer so uh, restarting that and our library as well that's been closed on Sundays 
uh, is ready to uh, be accessed again. And if you're newer here and haven't hung out in our library or at least visited it and poked your nose in, uh, it is a fantastic resource. We are a church who still has a library, and that is awesome because uh, there's fantastic stuff in there. A um, couple of things. Next weekend uh, is kind of annual general meeting weekend. Woo! Everybody clap. Yeah, it's a good setting. Um, so first one is our, our Sask MB uh, family of churches has its assembly on Saturday. And if you're interested in being part of that, it's by Zoom, so you don't have to travel anywhere. Uh, let me or Lisa Braun know. Um, on March 13th, then next Sunday, the morning service is, we're calling it our Vision Sunday, because we're going to talk about what God's been doing and what God's doing coming up for us. And what do we see? Uh, so it's a little bit of just storytelling and sharing and being together and have a little fun with that. And then in the evening, we'll kind of do the business part, okay? 6.30. Um, there is going to be, we're planning to have some child care, but we do need some volunteers. So if you can, uh, connect with Kelsey Lynn about that. Speaking of Kelsey Lynn, I'll invite you to come forward for a, a quick announcement. Um, as well, you got a hand with your bulletin, you got a one pager on how you might be able to get some relief help into the Ukraine. If you haven't given otherwise, one of our partners is Mennonite Central Committee, MCC, and they're, they already do work there and are easy to get um, some, uh, some help for people in desperate need right now. So uh, that's how you can do that. Good morning, everyone. If you are a mom, on your way in, you should have got a lovely little handout like this. We are really excited to be starting a mom's program here at Hepburn MB. We're going to do a four-week trial run of this. It's a little different than what we've done in the, pa in the recent past. Um, this is actually a structured program. We'll have a speaker, an activity, and a chance to build community and get to know one another. And so you do not need to have little kids to come to this. This is open to all moms. We are really excited to offer childcare for those who are five and under. And if you would rather, you know, hold some babies, help out with some of that, we would love your help. You could talk to Cheryl Bolt or myself. Um, but we are just really excited about this. There's some great speakers who are going to come and talk to us and help us consider how, where we put our hope. What do we hope in as women, as mothers, um, and where where can we find hope in this season? And so we're really excited about that. We are asking you to register. That just helps us as we prepare snack, as we get items together. And so that registration deadline is this week. The link is on here, but if you still have our Church Center app, you can find it on there. Just click on it, register. It's really easy. Um, there's three options for you to choose from, mom, children, or a baby who's going to stay with you. If you have questions, just come and find me. But yeah, we're just really excited about it and hope that you'll join us this week is, or in a couple of weeks when we get started. I'll invite you to uh, join me in prayer as we pray. Father in heaven, uh, thank you that you are not just the God of us, uh, but you are the God of the whole world. And we believe that in the deepest parts of our soul, um, that you are seeing um, the suffering of people all around the world. Um, but particularly right now, we think of, again, the conflict in Ukraine uh, that's uh, affecting people in multiple countries. Um, Lord, this is sad, and we know this is not something you desire to see. Um, so we pray for peace. We pray for relief. We pray for an end to conflict. Um, we pray that uh, those in power would, uh, would see the path to peace. And we pray for uh, those on the ground, such as, our, as Doug and Sherry shared, uh, our MB churches there and uh, other churches who are trying to provide help and be places of shelter and welcome. Um, we pray that you would, you would be seen in all things there, Lord. We feel so helpless so far away. Um, show us ways that we can pray and we can help. Um, Lord, we lift up those among us, some who've, who've had surgery this week, um, some who are struggling in other ways with addictions, mental health, chronic health issues, uh, aging, loneliness, whatever it is, Lord, that's uh, weighing upon us. We bring these to you, knowing that you hear us, that you see us, that you care so deeply. 
and that in Jesus you showed us that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for Jesus who, who shows us and who sees us and who comes to us in our need and says, what, what do you want me to do for you? So may we respond to you even today with our hearts, our whole hearts. And Lord, as we hear your word this morning uh, through our brother Daryl, pray that you would bless him and uh, speak through him. Your spirit is here among us, and you've got something to say. And uh, uh, just, just be with Daryl as he brings the word. Thank you, Lord, for this time to be uh, in worship of you. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, and as you've seen in your bulletin, uh, this morning, uh, Daryl Gunther, who is, you're like, Daryl Gunther, Gunther, which Gunther is that? Is that the Gunther's down the road that way, or which ones? You know, like, you're like, what? Uh, no, Daryl Gunther is from Winnipeg, Manitoba, and uh, his daughter has been among us for a long time, uh, Daniela Clausen. And uh, Daryl's a pastor in Winnipeg, and he's going to be bringing the word to us. Um, but as we get into that, I want to invite us to... Uh, so Daryl and I have been talking about this for a while. He's like, oh, man, when I'm out there sometime, we should speak. And so finally it came together. So today, so I'm really excited that you're here, Daryl. Um, but to get us into that, we're going to uh, read um, some scripture from Matthew 5 that Daryl's going to lead us in, uh, reflection on. Um, it's, uh, we're going to put it up on slides, and we're going to read back and forth, okay? So I'm going to invite you to stand for this, and uh, let's read. I'm going to invite you to read the bold text, okay? And I'll read the italics, and I'm going to put my glasses on to do that on my little printout. So let's, let's listen. This is the word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said. But I say to you, But whoever slaps you on your right cheek. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic. Whoever forces you to go one mile. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said. But I say to you. so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Therefore, you shall be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You can have a seat. We'll uh, take a moment to just reflect before Daryl comes and uh, we'll play some music. And those of you that have kids age one to four, our toddler room will be open now, so you can head out for that. God has made this declaration through His Son, the Prince of Peace. If we will enter in His kingdom, we must love our enemies. Lord, deliver us from hatred. Prejudice and cruelty Come remove discrimination That the truth may set us free Sinners, 
Well, good morning. It is truly a uh, honor and privilege to be with you this morning. We have sat in the pews uh, periodically over the last 10 years. Uh, this is something a little different, and so it's good to be with you. A great big thank, of, thank you to, to those of you that have uh, loved and supported and cared for Greg and Danny and the children for so many years. Uh, as a parent, you're, you're always a parent. And uh, you want to be there for uh, your kids and grandkids as much as you can. But being eight hours away, you can't always do that. And so uh, you have supported them. You've done that well. And I just want to thank you for that. And as Rod said, today is uh, a day we've been working on for a while. And uh, just so happens today is my wife's birthday. And so it made sense. To, to come here this weekend because one of the greatest gifts she could get was to hang out with three grandkids for a while, so that's super. It was um, a little before Christmas of 2018, and after a service one Sunday, a, a sweet lady in our congregation named Marie comes up to me and hands me this book. And she says, here's this book. It's a fascinating book. You can have it. You should read it. And right away I'm going, oh, okay. Uh, I'm looking at the book and I can kind of, you know, figure out the era from which it was printed. I worked for 27 years in the print industry before I became a pastor and you kind of know these things. And, and so I kind of, yeah, flip it open and, ah, hot off the press, 1953. <laughs> I don't read a lot of extra stuff, and so I'm a little picky about the stuff I read. And eh, anyway, so I, I took the book. I'm, I'm sure Pastor Rod would be way more gracious than I was. I took it like a nice pastor would, and uh, one day I cracked it open, and Marie was right. It's a fascinating book. There were 12 devotionals in there and uh, stories, insights. And I couldn't put the book down. It was uh, captivating. And today's message is based on some of those thoughts from this book. It's called Iron Shoes by uh, Roy Engel. And uh, just a side note, anytime you want to give Rod something to read, I'm sure he would do that. <laughs> There's a relatively innocent sounding sentence in the Sermon on the Mount spoken by Jesus. We're not having an altar call just yet. But. <laughs> There's an innocent sounding sentence in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus says it contains enough dynamite to change the course of this world. Jesus has presented one of the foundational principles here of the abundant life. And what a pity is it that people have walked on by, they've gone on the other side of the road and not standing in the truth of this verse. And the verse reads in Matthew 5, 41, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. The King James Version says, Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. I said this book is old, and there's a story in this book about a Sunday school teacher who gives the class this memory verse for the week. And so the week goes by, and the next week the class starts, and the teacher says, okay, remember the Bible verse? You know, Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Who can say the verse? And one little four-year-old boy raises his hand. And he says, okay, what's the verse? And the boy replied, whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him by train. <laughs> it, was a, it was a nice try. <laughs> Whoever forces you to go a mile, go with him too. Can we say that together? Whoever forces you to go a mile, go with him too. This short little piece of wisdom from Jesus misses its full impact unless you understand the culture and the setting of that day in which it was spoken. 
the background and setting are very important. See, we don't understand what it's like to be overtaken by an opposing force. World War II was, what, 80 years ago. People in the Ukraine right now, they understand that very well. They're dealing with that today. And we need to support them in our prayers. But at the time that Jesus walked this earth, the Roman Empire was taking over more and more pieces of territory. And when they would take over a new town or a new territory, they would perform something that was called a subjection ritual. With this, the Romans would place a yoke in the marketplace or somewhere near the gate, and the Romans were made to walk underneath that yoke, symbolizing that they were paying tribute and obeying this Roman takeover. And you can see the picture on behind me. In the small print of that agreement, and you always need to read the small print, right, was this little requirement that if a Roman soldier or official wanted you to carry his pack or run an errand or guide him for a mile, you had to do it. And this was a very humbling experience for the Jews, as Moses called them a stiff-necked people. It was stipulated that not only in the case of emergency, only in the case of emergency hour, you had to go further than a mile, but you had to go that one mile. But the Jews, they hated that mile. And there's some other texts, ancient texts, that were written that most Jewish boys or young men, they would go from their place, they would go one mile down the road. They would take a stake and bam, 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 they would hammer a stake into the ground. And then they would go one mile the other way down their road. And bam, 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 they would hammer a stake into the road. And I'm going one mile, not one step further. That was their thought. And so now if you think of that statement that Jesus makes in that context... Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. With that cultural setting in mind, imagine the group of Jews standing around and listening to Jesus, hearing his words. See, Jesus said a few things while on earth that ruffled some feathers, didn't he? And this was one of them. The people are listening intently, looking at one another, marveling at his amazing truths. This is on the Sermon on the Mount. This is in there, you know, Matthew 5. Blessed be the poor, those who mourn, the gentle. And then when that's done, he says, you're a city on a hill. You're the salt of the earth. Rod has been teaching, you know, what's the mission? You know, how to do missions Jesus' way. Jesus teaches them about the law, about anger, about lust, about divorce. And next comes teaching on how to deal with people that kind of rub you the wrong way. And then out of left field, he drops this bomb. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. I can see them shaking their heads, clenching their fists, muttering to each other. What do you mean? Does, does Jesus approve of this Roman takeover? What in the world is the matter with this guy? And I think Jesus deliberately made this statement to the Jews and to us to instill an amazing principle in our lives. And to miss this principle would be tragic. Tragic for your personal life, tragic for your career, tragic for your business, for your family, all aspects of life. Does it mean we literally walk one more mile? No, it doesn't. What it means is to do a little more than is required or expected of you. In the Sermon on the Mount, in which we find this nugget of truth, Jesus is telling us about happiness, about contentment, about the abundant life. His point in this one little sentence is that you cannot have the abundant life without practicing the second mile. And I know, deep down in your hearts, someone right now 
one of you, you're rolling your eyes and you're going, we've been going the second mile for over two years now. We're tired. We're tired of COVID. We're tired of restrictions. We're tired of wearing masks. We're tired of changes. We're tired of winter. We're tired of minus 30. We're tired of shoveling snow. We're tired of... You fill in the blank. And then to be told, go the second mile? No, thank you. Let's look at four observations about this second mile this morning, or as Dr. Bill Bright calls it, the mile that brings a smile. First of all, the second mile always leaves a deposit of happiness in the heart of the one who travels it. Years ago, there would be surgeons who would perform surgeries while young doctors would watch and learn. And there'd be a kind of amphitheater type atmosphere where they would watch from the seats hovering over the operating room. And one day, a famous doctor performed an uh, operation, and a young doctor approached him after, cautiously and respectfully. He asks us if he can ask a question, and he says, Sure, sure son, what, what is it? Well, doctor, the books and instructions say that when doing stitches, one knot is all that is necessary providing you do it right. Well, says the doctor, you're certainly correct. The instructions are one knot is correct. And I know what your next question is going to be. Why do I tie three knots? Yes, doctor, why? Why three? Well, since everyone else is gone, I'll tell you a secret. That third knot is my sleeping knot. If I wake up in the middle of the night and rehearse that surgery in my mind, as I get up to think about all this, I will end up like, did I do that knot? Did I tie that knot? Will that patient heal well? And so I tie one knot, I tie two knots, and I tie a third knot. And I know it cannot come loose. And I'm going to smile and fall back to sleep, knowing I did a little extra. And then he said this, it's a great principle for life. If you do more than is required of you, you yourself will find a lot of happiness that you cannot find another way. It applies to everything in life. And that's very true. The second mile always leaves a deposit of happiness in the one who travels it. Think of a young Jewish man working in the field. A Roman soldier comes along and yells, at him, Hey, hey, son, come, come carry my pack. And he has to, according to the law. And so he slams down his shovel. I'd like to hit the guy over the head with it, but I'll just put it down. And he shuffles his feet over and grabs the pack and puts it on, and he mutters all the way down there, maybe saying some bad words in Hebrew, I don't know. And, and he goes to the one mile, and he slams the pack down. And he walks away, thinking... I wish my country would take over Rome one day, and he's going to carry my pack 10 miles. Compare that with another man. Hey, son, come carry my pack. And the young man with a hop and a skip is over the fence. He picks up the pack, and they chat together well past that one-mile mark. And the Roman soldier finally notices, and he says, oh, you don't have to carry my pack any further. And the young man says, oh, it's okay. I'll carry it to the city's edge. I have so much to ask you about Rome. And as they leave, they shake hands and part ways. The second man now has a song in his heart. He double times it back to the field. He whistles all the way. He gets back to work. When he gets home, he wrestles with his children. And his wife looks at him and says, wives have a way of knowing these things. His wife looks and says, I know what you did today. You went the second mile, didn't you? Proverbs 15, 13, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. But when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. 
You, going the second mile, does something great within you. Secondly, the second mile brings out the best in others. I'd like you to think back for a minute. Think back to the events of your life. Who taught you the second mile principle in your life? Maybe a parent, maybe a friend or co-worker. You see, when you walk that second mile, it starts somebody down that same beautiful road. For me, I think it was my father. We were four boys at home, so there's always something going on after school and rarely was it homework. And I didn't understand it at the time, but my father must have been under a fair bit of stress. He was the manager of the local financial institution, the Steinbach Credit Union. And with that came all kinds of thoughts, you know, stressed about stuff in the day, anxious, worry, all these things going on. But when my father came home, there was either football or, or street hockey or something going on, and he was right in there, three-piece suit and all. He was enjoying playing with us. The second mile was on display for me. And I know I'm a little guilty this morning of preaching to the choir, as they say. And I've seen and heard of the second mile being displayed right here in this congregation. I know about the hours of faithful volunteer service. And I've seen and heard of people rallying around a cause, maybe financially or with helps. The journey through Christmas that you do, that presentation, Hours and hours of the second mile. This congregation has often gone the second or third mile for Danny and Greg, and we thank you so much for that. And I've seen in your congregation forgiveness and perseverance and love and patience and a host of other God-filled qualities. You going the second mile. And that inspires me to go the second mile. Which leads to point three, the second mile lightens life's burdens. The life lived in the second mile is one of the greatest principles that Jesus taught to bring joy to your surroundings. And I believe it because I have seen it on display many times, that of one person, be it in a home, a workplace, a school, a social group, and yes, maybe even a church, if one person practices this second mile lifestyle, they bring with them a transformation like no other. Think of all the homes that would have more joy if the second mile would be on display. Think of the harmony and unity you would have at your workplace if the second mile was walked every day. Think about the get-together with friends, how sweeter they would be walking the second mile. Think about how many church conflicts would have been avoided had the second mile been walked. What would all these places and situations look like if the second mile was walked? Just a few nicer things done than anybody had a right to ask of you. What a difference it would make in our homes, our schools, our jobs, our, fu our social functions, and our churches. Think of the atmosphere the second mile creates. Being a little kinder, a little nicer, a little sweeter. Think of the joy it creates. You love going home. You look forward to Monday morning, a new work week. You look forward to going to church. You look forward to your annual general meeting next week, hanging out with the Second Mile Club. The Second Mile is full of blessings. And fourthly, God went the Second Mile. Jesus never gave a command that he himself did not live. And now you might think, well, of course, he's Jesus. He can do anything. And we get this inferiority complex. Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. So if you start getting this inferiority complex right off the start, thinking, oh, Jesus did this, surely I can't, that is wrong thinking. Jesus emptied himself. 
Now, Jesus was still fully God, but he chose the restrictions of being a man for a reason. And I believe this is the reason that he could show us that we can do it too. Let me share with you a few more verses this morning. John 12, 49 to 50. Jesus says, For I do not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. And John 5, 19 to 20. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. So according to the words of Jesus, he only did the things he saw his Father doing and said the things his Father was saying. A simple recipe for us, right? You see, if Jesus exercised his full authority and position, being fully God while here on earth, then we would become nothing more than a fan in the stands, cheering on Jesus, like we cheer on the Winnipeg Jets later today, saying, way to go! Way to go, Jesus! Another miracle! Way to go, another profound teaching! Another second mile! Way to go, Jesus! And we cheer from the stands. But God had something else in mind. He had Jesus set the example for us. This is how it should work. Be in tune with what the Father is saying and doing, and we are to say and do likewise. Jesus set the example for us walking the second mile. Matthew 14, 13 and 14. Now when Jesus heard it, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place by himself. And when the multitudes heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when he went ashore, they saw a great multitude, and he felt compassion for them and healed their sick. The context of that passage, Jesus had just received news that King Herod had beheaded John the Baptist. There was a limit to Jesus' physical endurance, his emotional stress, and he honored that limit. We see times like Mark 1, 35, Luke 6, 12, Jesus finding moments to be alone. He withdrew to renew himself. This must have been hard for Jesus. Demands on his physical strength and stress. He endured that beyond a limit many times. Matthew 4, 15, in the Amplified Version, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weakness and temptations, but one who has been tempted, knowing exactly how it feels to be human in every respect as we are, yet without committing any sin. Do you find it necessary to restore and refresh yourself, enduring things we have to endure in this world, periods of difficulty, does continual stress zap your energy? And since Jesus was flesh and blood, just as we are, Jesus reacted to pressures as we do. Daily demands on Jesus became enormous. If you had the power to heal incurable sicknesses, can you imagine how many requests you would receive? If you could teach in the manner Jesus did, can you imagine how many people would want you to come and speak? And if you said no to someone who was counting on your help, can you imagine how that person would react? There was always one more paralyzed person, one more blind person, one more possessed person who needed help. Some people came to Jesus for the wrong reason. Some hated him, and they wished to discredit him. Some wished to do him harm. Jesus' intent was to be God's example of what to do and how to feel in every circumstance. It was so demanding 
that there were times Jesus could not go into populated places because people expected too much. Consider Mark 3.20. Jesus came home and the crowd gathered again, so much to an extent that they could not even eat a meal. Can you imagine coming home and being so crowded in by people, so many demands on you, you can't even have supper? Someone always needed something or wanted something. Yet even when he was tired, even when he was generally needed to be alone, even when he dealt with stresses you and I have never known, he always cared about people and went the second mile. Even his enemies knew he cared. One of the incredible things about Jesus is that he felt compassion on people regardless of his needs. The ultimate second mile was the cross. The day that Jesus hung on the cross on Golgotha. You know, there was a popular Christian song out about four years ago called So Will I by Hillsong United. And one line really gripped me that I'd never thought of before. And here's part of that song. It says, God of salvation, you chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. I'd never thought of that before. Colossians 1.16, For in him all things were created. This song rattled my cage. Jesus created Mount Golgotha. As he's forming and sculpting that hill, thinking, one day I'm going to hang on a cross here. Taking on the sin of the world, being forsaken by my Father. The nails in his wrists, the pain of even breathing. In the middle of all that, Jesus lifts his face to heaven and cries out to the Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The second mile. I'd like to give you a bunch of points of what this second mile looks like for you. But I can't. I'm not you. I don't know what's happening in your home, your workplace, your school, or in your heart. You see, the second mile has to do with the heart. Danny Silk is a pastor in California, and he talks about a culture of honor. And he says this, People cannot determine whether or not we honor them or not. It has nothing to do with the other person. Did the Jews think the Romans were worthy of going the second mile? Absolutely no way. But the amount to which we love and we respect and we honor and we serve people has nothing to do with who they are. You may say, well, they don't deserve it. They haven't earned it. Well, what do we deserve? Matthew 5, 14, 15, the two verses right after what we know as the Lord's Prayer. It says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Going the second mile requires us all to forgive. The fact the Apostle Peter comes up to Jesus one day, Matthew 18, 21, 22, and Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. In other words, stop counting and just go the second mile. It all boils down to love. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor as you hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not the Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Tax collectors and Gentiles in Scripture, that's code for the unsaved. So look out your window. Look and see what the unsaved do. And are we, the redeemed ones, not called to something higher? The first mile is always crowded. We all have things that we're required to do. The second mile is fairly deserted. Not a lot of traffic there. But when people see you on that second mile, they'll notice. They might mock you, but that's okay, because deep inside they want to know why. Why go the second mile? And then you have the opportunity to tell them about Jesus. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It sums it up very nicely for us, and I'll close with that. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by cha changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I hope you noticed the footprints in the sand on the slides. We absolutely can't do this second mile on our own strength. May God bless you as you go the second mile this week. And for the days and weeks and months and years you have remaining until God takes us home. Amen. Thank you, Daryl. Thanks for challenging us and leading us. Um, second mile. Second mile. And I uh, invite you to go into this week thinking about what is that little more I can do in my place, in my context. Um, I liked how you talked about how we, this is something we practice too, right? Something we can get better at. Um, the decor committee put up some purple this week to represent Lent, which is a season, again, of walking towards the cross, 40 days before Easter, where we remember and think of Jesus who went the second mile. And this is our challenge, even through Lent. Maybe make that part of your Lent practice, just to just remember the cross and say, what can I do? What's the little thing I can do? Uh, even now, in this context, just go that little extra and uh, follow Jesus in that way, all the way to the cross. So leave you with that. Thank you. Uh, Daryl, for bringing that word to us. Um, we, uh, at about 10.50, there'll be check-in for our kids' uh, classes that are downstairs. And uh, well, after 11, our adult Sunday class will start here. We're going to be discussing a bit of what Daryl shared and as well taking some time to pray this morning for Ukraine. Uh, so if you want to join us for that, that would be awesome. We have our M Bistro uh, happening back there, so there's some coffee available uh, I invite you to do that as you're comfortable. And uh, maybe just before we go, Diane here, uh, our friend, said, you know what? If it's Audrey's birthday, we should sing happy birthday as we go, shouldn't we? Okay? Yeah, she says. So we're going to embarrass you, Audrey. <laughs> All right, here we go. And a hug there, too. Nice. All right. Well, go in peace, everyone. We'll see you.